climate agreement. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure and a joy to be here in Appreciate Congress. Thank you very much, Piru. It's uh, it's I'm, I'm very glad, very happy to be again in Rosario. I spent six days in Rosario a, 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 one year and a half ago and loved it really. And really, I have to uh, praise the um, fantastic organization of this Congress. I made this option to talk about Paris, agree Paris agreements. I wanted to start pointing out a contrast between what happened in 2009 in Copenhagen in the climate conference and what happened uh, this time in Paris. It's very usual for people to consider that the international conferences are irrelevant with very little meaning. They are bureaucratic. And I wanted to point out that uh, that is not the case. Uh, uh, much progress has been made in Paris. Uh, Copenhagen experience was a little bit frustrating, but on the contrary, Paris was uh, really a celebration that that allows us to agree with what the secretary who chaired the uh, conference said, Cristina Figueras. He said that the signal is beyond noise. And what does this mean? This means that we are about to start a change which is not a local or localized uh, change referred to a specific sector. This is uh, the change of a model. It is not an economic model, but really it's a pattern of resource usage. Uh, and this is a very significant change, and Paris it sets a framework along these lines. Why? The starting point could be other than, couldn't be as um, concerning as negative. Uh, world economy depends and relies a lot on fossil fuels, and this is a huge dependence in Latin America and even in Argentina. One of the uh, objectives of the conference was and this was also mentioned in the uh, Olympic Games because we are going to have athletes with this uh, signal, with this notice, 1.50 degree at the most. If we would interrupt a greenhouse uh, gases, we uh, we uh, already have an increase of temperature to 1.3 uh, degrees, so 1.5 degree is very ambitious. And this is what was uh, proposed in Paris. Another ambition of Paris Conference is to achieve zero emission by 2050. This means that we have to start right away continuing reducing emissions because this won't be achieved if we start as late as 2049. 80% of the global energy matrix right now is fossil. Experts work on the carbon budget. This means how much, how can we uh, uh, emit or uh, how much can carbon emissions can be if we keep if we if we are to keep below two degrees this makes up a budget this is what we call the carbon budget if we continue as we are today our carbon budget will exhaust will be depleted by 2036. So the ambitions of the conference are really significant. I don't need to explain this chart because it shows the declination uh, rate of our emissions. We have a huge 
distribution problem when we speak about climate change. And why? Because the uh, the most of the emissions came historically from the wealthiest countries in the world. So far, the OECD uh, member countries are the countries that uh, the highest carbon consumption have in absolute terms. Now, India and China have uh, are, are following them, but. Uh, North America, United States uh, consumes uh, far more fossil uh, fuels than developing countries or poor countries. This generates uh, destructive logics on the part of developing countries, which until 2009, not very long ago, uh, and this was the discourse of uh, the G77 um, group plus uh, China. They said, we are not to reduce our emissions because emissions were already uh, generated by the wealthy countries and they still continue increasing their emissions. They are responsible for reducing emissions and not us. It's as if we were in a ship that starts to wreck, to sink, and says we are only to fill in the holes, only some of them, those who have been responsible. I have not been responsible for that, so I won't uh, a, a clog any hole. So this is a ridiculous logic. There is also a very serious political problem. Why? Because the main driver of, of um, emissions was energy. Now transportation, and it has become a sort of lifestyle. That is threatened. You see the Trump uh, candidate to become a president in U.S. His speech is, we are going to put an end with all this story of fighting against climate change. This is uh, the story of people who live outside the United States. Real Americans want a, a lifestyle that requires the climate change. Um, I like what happened with the ozone uh, when uh, we had to determine what was the reason why the ozone layer was uh, broken or was impacted. Uh, um, the, and they, that the, what was depleted, and this was thought uh, much better, but climate change is far more complex. It's a multidimensional problem, what we called a wicked problem, a problem the reason of which is not uh, very clear. Uh, Naomi Klein, in her book that was published last year, uh, which is representative of global left-wing parties, says that Argentina, Brazil, Ecuador, and Venezuela followed a model that she calls progressive uh, extractivism. But the, the, the pressure on emissions is really a very strong pressure. So what is the contribution of Paris Conference? Each country, regardless of its uh, development, submitted their commitments to reduce emissions, national commitments with uh, very clear goals. This uh, allowed them to break with the polarity that was clear in Copenhagen conference. Uh, uh, there we had countries with binding uh, obligations to reduce and other countries that only present their intent to reduce. Look at this chart. 
it shows that in spite of the fact that all the countries uh, met their or fulfilled their promises to reduce emissions uh, by the end of the 21st century we would have an increase in temperature not of two degrees as the target is but really 3.5 degrees and this was considered uh, an evidence of the failure of this conference. In the first place, we need to consider that uh, this national commitments are uh, insufficient. Uh, that was acknowledged in the text. If this weren't uh, national commitments that refer to 3.5 degrees, we would have 4.5 degrees. That is far worse. So the commitments themselves uh, reduce this expectation or this hope to um, uh, reduce emissions and reduce temperature. So the conference established uh, mechanisms by which these commitments uh, are reviewed every five years. This is very important because every five years the countries will have to submit their achievements uh, in order to fulfill their commitments and be more ambitious, even have more ambitious, ambitious goals. Uh, why uh, this progress was achieved in Paris? Something which is very important, because the civil society started to move. In Latin America, this mobilization is not so significant. I think that we should move, should organize, and should um, express our disagreement with all this. I will never forget the day when 400,000 people uh, made a demonstration in New York against climate change. In Rio, the in Rio de Janeiro, a small group of 200 and 300 uh, people embraced Petrobras to defend the uh, uh, state company. This only shows how far we are from this uh, mobilization that does occur in the global society in the rest of the world. You can you can uh, Google in internet under the dome. This is a documentary film that uh, shows uh, corruption in China. This was shown only for 24 days, uh, 44 hours, and then it was banned uh, by the uh, Chinese government. When you see pollution in India, there's also a mobilization of the civil society. So the creation of a um, business movement against uh, climate change, this, uh, this has to do with the B system, benefit corporation, and this is also uh, related to the biomimicry uh, movement. This means uh, uh, doing um, technological innovations from nature, uh, capitalism, the sharing economy or circular economy, and uh, the business sector is it, 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 it does not only follow social corporate responsibility. Businesses today have very interesting proposals to fight against climate change. Even crude oil companies, for instance, Total, the um, French company, took the commitment to be a leading company in sun energy and uh, committed not to um, explore oil. The third uh, very important point is a sort of carbon bubble was um, created the same as the real estate 
carbon, a real estate bubble. Now we are before a carbon bubble. A, on the basis of the uh, uh, progress of renewable energy, the um, bad reputation of fossil fuels, and the uh, the oil oil uh, surplus, and thanks to the shale gas discovery uh, in which Argentina has very interesting uh, reserves. Uh, these assets are abandoned. There's a group, Carbon Tracker, Carbon Tracker, that is studying this very closely. In the European Union last month, a law was passed saying that 3.4 trillion trillion, 3.4 trillion euros of uh, pension funds, uh, European pension funds that uh, are for 75 million people. These funds will be forced to consider climate change in their investments. There's a um, diverse movement that has reached uh, thousand million assets and this means that oil companies sh shares are dropping because they are so linked to fossil fuels this carbon tracker is studying that there's a movement in big financial companies to diversement and this is number four, but this is a crucial item, in my opinion, probably the most important one. This really shows the change from Copenhagen to Paris. It's impressive to see how in only six years the energy scenario, the energy perspective have changed. In 2009, no one could have said that China and India were to develop and were to electrify their countries without resorting to carbon. But now, China has already picked the use of carbon, and India has plans to implant solar energy panels that the plan for them is very ambitious. This will expand solar energy use in the world, and they have exceeded any, um, any um, ideas, even um, Greenpeace uh, prospects. Between 2016 to 2020, India will implement solar energy panels equivalent to six Itaipu power plants. And you may tell me, but this is intermittent energy. But the development in solar batteries is really impressive. And now they have bought Solar City, which is a sector, an industry that will develop even more and faster. So we will see a drop in renewable energy prices. And there's a program called Global Apollo Program um, founded by a British scientist that shows that despite this progress, we have to invest more on renewable energies, much more than actually invested. We have to remember that subsidies and grants to fossil fuels are still very big, even in Argentina. The investment in renewable energies is much less to the investment in fossil fuels. When the curve uh, turns upside down, the trend uh, will be revolutionary. Latin America, how does it fit in this context? 
In order to talk about Latin America, I have to say that Latin America is getting further and further away from the global frontier of innovation. We are suppliers of low-value-added uh, products, products that uh, are very competitive in agriculture, but these products have very little value added. We have gone through a process where our economies have gone back to raw material production, and we have these we have um, turned away from industrialization. The problem is that countries that have no manufacturing will not have quality services. They will not develop quality services. If Germany is today at 4.0 level, industrial level, is because Germany has developed the services that helped manufacturing reach the 4.0 level. This shows how far we are from developed countries. Latin America ranks very low. We are uh, we rank very low in terms of global competitiveness. Why? Why is this important? Well, because our continent is used to consider that competitive advantages of economies were the most important things. And we had these competitive advantages because we could uh, reduce production costs. We did that quite well, especially main agriculture producers. That is good, but today is not enough. Why? Because uh, in a 21st century economy, the crucial thing is not to compete with low costs, but to compete with competitiveness derived from value adding. And value adding comes not from exploiting natural resources or agriculture or mining as we did so far as we have done so far. This is a hypothesis that I give you for you to think about it. There are big consequences on, for instance, our infrastructure. We continue supporting a vision where infrastructure in Brazil we would say that we are looking backwards. That is the vision, a vision that looks backwards. We continue developing plans to build big hydroelectrical power plants. Though today I read that the Ministry of the Environment in Brazil does not like continuing the building of big hydroelectrical plants in Brazil. That has a big impact socially, economically, and politically, because these power plants were part of the corruption structure of the former government. When Petrobras still was a powerful company, Brazil had these plants to produce energy, basically from fossil fuels, 
fossil fuels plus hydroelectricity was very modern in the 1950s, but not today in 2016, because it represents centralized models of generation and distribution. When the current trend is, this is not only a trend, there is an internet of energy currently, that's the trend. There is someone that illustrates this idea. If Graham Bell would wake up today and would look at a mobile phone, he would say, what is this? I don't understand. Where is the central operator? There are no wires. If Thomas Edison would wake up today and would check our electrical systems with long wires that connect the Amazon to Sao Paulo, he would say, it's fantastic. Everything is as I left it. This is the opposite of what happens in Germany, in California, and in China. So infrastructure is something we lack. We are building an infrastructure to reduce costs and an infrastructure that uh, does not promote uh, innovation. Number two, cities. Our cities have a territorial apartheid. The poor people are in the peripheries. They have to travel or commute long distances. And these societies represent exactly the opposite of what the UN habitat promotes. Our cities are not compact, integrated, and connected. A big example is the largest, uh, most important social program in Brazil in the past 12 years, Minha Casa Minha Vida. It is a very right wing to say that my life is my home. No, my life is my community. The opportunities I have among the people I live with. There is a Chilean architect, Alejandro Aravena. A city is a concentration of opportunities, not an agglomeration of houses. This vision vis-a-vis -vis urban infrastructure is also very present in our city planners. And it's typical from an economy where sustainability is not driving decisions. As to agriculture, I wanted to mention something that is very positive. And this is happening in Brazil. This is the Brazil Weather Coalition. So far, our agriculture, even though it is very efficient and has a large export capacity, has not been a manifestation of our ability to show knowledge. It, will, it has basically been an agriculture that has destroyed the environment. And this coalition, Brazil Weather, Forest and Agriculture, has started to be a very significant business association and partnership, trying to change this reality, trying to make people walk towards an agriculture that will destroy the environment less and that will regenerate or give life back to the environment. We have a commitment to recover 12 million hectares of forests. This will demand farmers to get involved in reforestation processes. It's very important to mention that the new uh, forest uh, code 
says that each farmer has to publicly show the way that he uses his land because we have to respect certain environmental conditions, certain forests, and we need to be transparent. Transparent, being accountable is crucial. 20, 30 years ago, we would say that secret is the core of business. Currently, the core of any business is transparency, being accountable, explaining what happens inside the business and transform that into value adding. The name of this conference is Resilience. That's why I am convinced that farmers in Latin America, especially in the most important countries, that is Brazil and Argentina, have a lot to win when they get on the digital revolution train. We are just starting to understand the significance of digital revolution in agriculture. We know that there is an industrial internet of things, that the most advanced industry in the world is the one that is supported by smart objects and in the ability of human intelligence to create new intelligent objects in agriculture, this has to be applied. And that means to add value through knowledge, information, intelligence, and not only by reducing costs. We need uh, an agriculture that uh, emits, uh, that produces less uh, uh, gas, um, greenhouse uh, gas emissions. I believe that a meeting like this one, organized by APRESID, focusing on resilience, show the fantastic potential of our community to take advantage of digital technologies, basing all efforts in our traditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. A pleasure to hear to hear your presentation, to tour with you this analysis. We couldn't agree more because COP21 in Paris was what you have explained. We were invited as farmers, and it was really great for us because usually these events are very bureaucratic only for decision makers and scientists, and they don't hear those of us who are in different activities. We were able to make a presentation with our beliefs and on the other hand, it's really encouraging to see that our country also took a stance along these lines and is already working. The government um, created a cabinet which includes the participation of all the uh, ministers. Uh, there's something that you said that really hurts us deep in our hearts because we believe we are farmers in Latin America, especially in the Southern Corns country. We really uh, uh, would like to be part of the solution with our a kind of agriculture, not only with our technological innovation, but also with institutional innovation and organizational innovation. The question is how 
what possibilities we have uh, along these lines because you showed us the different range of possibilities what pos what possibilities are there for us uh, as a region you have a uh, great potential many possibilities really and at the same time the pressure to change will be stronger increasingly stronger one of the technological strengths of the next 30 years is tracking, traceability. A traceability so far has been considered as the uh, as an, a niche activity or a luxury activity. This won't be this way any longer. Traceability will be an activity for all economic activities, especially uh, activities that involve the soil resource. That's, that's what I meant when I talked about transparency. The reaction uh, in the past uh, regarding traceability was that every time you post or you uh, regarded um, social environmental topics regarding agriculture, the reaction of our foreign offices or our Ministry of Agriculture was that this was only a protectionist uh, attitude of developed country to keep us far from the market. and. And we were uh, satisfied or pleased with what we were already doing, and we didn't uh, even try to go towards innovation. What does this mean? Uh, this is far more than following environmental laws. This is providing a product that can be launched into the markets with uh, the assurance that it has been produced in a environmental friendly uh, conditions that, that do not impact uh, the soil or water or uh, the environment. This issue of the ecosystem service integrity does not, or integrality, does not refer only to agriculture. It also refers to what I mentioned in my presentation: is the B team. What does the B team does? which is made up by Guillermo Leal, Richard Brampton, the Puma president. They analyze the non-paid costs of the economic operations. If companies had to pay for the ecosystem services, it that the society use and they destroy, I'm referring to waste, uh, biodiversity, emissions, what would be the cost of that? A global company, by the requirement of KPMG, it is not something that was delivered by the military. KPMG asked this question to uh, the 1600 global corporation. So how much would you have to pay for, if you had to pay for the cost of your environmental operations, your profit would be zero. And this has been published in a Greenpeace a report in 2015. What do I mean by this? In these situations where we pay for what the market demands, but we don't pay for things that are not part of the market, this situation cannot be sustained for any sector. And calculations show or estimations show that 
the non-pay costs uh, are the most important ones. And so this will have to be modified. I think that the good news is that the digital revolution offers a powerful tools and instruments to make these modifications. Thank you very much, Ricardo. I tell the audience, I, I let the audience know that you can ask questions. And as we wait for these questions, I will continue asking my own questions. In our countries, we share the fact that in many sectors, uh, the 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 private companies had made much more progress than public companies. What is the reconversion possibility in our countries to be able to take or fulfill the commitments we have individually taken, individually and globally? How can we go about this? What can we do? I have the feeling that this has to do or involves the whole society. But it is very important to have the mobilization of the business sector against deindustrialization of our economy. This uh, is equal to losing opportunities. Uh, clearly, this also implies a very strong change in education. We won't be able to achieve it without education. I don't know what the facts are in Argentina, but in Brazil, uh, data show a delay or, or a lagging behind in science, in mathematics. If we compare Brazilian students with other international students, or uh, even in elite schools in Brazil where sciences and mathematics uh, is not as important as they should be. If you don't achieve this, we won't be able to utilize or to take the opportunities of the um, digital revolution in the first place. And in the second uh, um, and, and secondly, this implies having uh, public policies, but it also uh, implies having social movements that are capable of changing what has happened so far. Or uh, we need social coalitions as it happens in Brazil. This coalition involves building companies or construction companies and everything that was done in the construction of hydroelectrical um, uh, plants, etc. Uh, things have changed now, and we have this possibility to change. And this change has to be implemented in order to try incorporate these new changes. The, the problem of digital revolution, progress is exponential. And so if we lose one year in this uh, race, we won't be able to recover it. Competition is far beyond, and so we have to go beyond and step forward. This is a problem in countries with inequality. I have more questions. We have been sharing with you things with the mayors and with the secretary of agriculture in the different provinces and representatives of the private sector. In I perceive throughout these past years, with a uh, with a view to develop and uh, achieving uh, continuous improvement, we have put in place an a certified agriculture program uh, 
uh, it is not easy to implement this in the private sector because farmers are not used to this type of processes and so all the procedure is is, is slower but we also share another problem and this is What happens with the conflicts among the different ministry areas? What are the desks that they have to take care of? Something that concerns us how this type of possibilities, which uh, means differentiation, not only for Argentina, but also for the rest of the world, which means not only saying that we are producing in a different way, but also we need to do it for politicians or for decision makers. This is a huge question uh, mark. This implies problems of marketing, problems of uh, launching things into the market. Certification is essential. It is an essential part of this technological strength of the uh, 21st century. It goes hand in hand with traceability or with tracking. It is not something that the government should do or must do. If the government is involved in certification, this will mean the end of certification. It's not that I'm against the participation or the presence of the government in the economic life of society, but it, well, certification is different. Certification is a cultural change, a mindset change. It's a change in the attitude of the farmer. And this change in the attitude of the farmer has a, a multiplying effect on the local communities. As the most interesting example is in the Pará states all the the, uh, the municipalities in 2008 were sentenced for excess of deforestation. The government said, okay, this is the end of this. These municipalities won't have any more financing or funding from the uh, Bank of Brazil. And the timber companies uh, were closed, so demonstrations because people lost their jobs. But the, uh, the government didn't change that. What did the mayor said? He brought together NGOs, farmers, international NGOs, um, traders, and he was able to achieve an agreement among all these players to change the production models. And the effects were not only positive on agriculture, but also it had a positive impact on the community, on the city, because people became aware that it was important to have a, a city, no matter how small it is, to have an interesting, attractive city uh, which uh, encouraged uh, living there. So the attitude of the federal government was a signal, but this was not an initiative of the federal government. The initiative was by the initiative came from the uh, uh, farmers themselves that were led by a mayor who was not a professional politician. Today, he's a secretary of state, etc., etc., but then I can, I can give you information about him. His name is Adney Demaki. How does the climate impact on water variable, considering that it is a limited resource? What is the future perspective? Less than six months ago, there was the rumor that it would be necessary to to take the people away from San Pablo because they would run out of water. 
and that rumor uh, was had, had was true because the drought that occurred in southeast Brazil was so uh, severe that the threat was not only on San Pablo but also the electrical plants that were the assurance of clean energy were always uh, threatened. The most important positive initiative uh, with regard to this has taken place in Minas Gerais where the farmers received payments. This is a very small initiative but it's really promising. Farmers receive payment for producing water and how do they produce water reforestate with the reforestation and they are paid by this with this this type of economic behavior that uh, payment uh, uh, that farmers are paid for environmental services is becoming more important Soybean is important, but for the world at large, water is far more important as any other product coming from agriculture. Farmers have and will have uh, more responsibility not to only to produce, uh, to produce agricultural products, but also to provide uh, environmental service for the uh, benefit of mankind. What are the steps that we have to um, go in order to get closer to the innovation frontier? I think that nobody can't tell this. Uh, today, with my gray hair, I know that I will have a very serious... When, when I looked at a problem that nobody can answer, I looked at the people that is 60 years old. It's, is if anything important will happen in Latin America regarding the innovation, this will be will come from the young people who are inside of the maker culture. Chris Anderson wrote a book that is entitled Makers. I recommend heartily this book because he shows that there was a distance between the inventor the inventor and the businessman if somebody invented something he had to find something to implement that invention and to transform that invention in a product and the digital era is less and less that way so people that had the initiative to invent will be the people who will be doing things in fact and this is the maker culture this maker culture is disseminated all over latin america and uh, interestingly enough not only in the most privileged and in central regions but also in the periphery it is a uh, very important to release this young potential for uh, for creation, which is represented by the maker culture. If this is a Latin American phenomenon. I think that things will come, especially from there. Obviously, they will also come from research institutes, companies, etc. But the role of uh, the maker young people is central. It's a different activism, different from that uh, that we had deca decades ago because uh, these people have no utopian uh, ideas. They really have value and they value, to, they value the capacity uh, to do things. Thank you very much, Ricardo. We are running out of time, so this question is how could we re-industrialize Latin America in a sustainable manner? Many researchers from the MIT, Ricardo Hausmann, Danny Wardrick, etc., wrote many papers about this. 
The problem is the, that we underwent an early deindustrialization process. So we weren't able to become industrially mature. And before being mature or becoming mature, we were already deindustrialized. And to my opinion, the solution will be to support and to incorporate what the digital revolution does. But I must admit that as far as I have uh, read from the experts uh, on this topic, uh, nobody uh, knows clearly what will happen. Thank you very much, Ricardo. With the book that Ricardo has just recommended, uh, this is the fifth book she's he's recommended today. I will share with you his recommendations. Thank you for encouraging us to continue along this way and also for uh, uh, suggesting that we should do things together. And also, thank you for your warning not to be too complacent not to be comforted or to be pleased with what we're already doing. They try to do more things. Thank you for this opportunity. You have to go to the next panel so you share your knowledge with other people in other room. I think that there are lots of things that we can share with other, with other countries in the region, but also at the global level. We, with uh, the certainty of using um, tool that will contribute to fighting against um, um, climate change and we also have the power of bioeconomy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.